and I'm actually from Belgium and Holland and I don't know which one myself but both and uh, I moved to Sweden two years ago kind of more slightly more two and a half maybe uh, to work for Starbreeze I uh, started in uh, 2003 or two I think in the game industry on the age of 19 I think so I dropped out of school and I just went working in the game industry you gotta do something so uh, the first thing I, uh, I started out ma just making levels so I started out with Unreal 1 I got the game there was an editor with it so I just opened the editor I just clicked around until I kind of understood it I didn't have internet and there were no tutorials back then there was nothing basically nothing the only thing I had was uh, a txt file text file from uh, epic that was like two pages long that basically said you have to do this this and this and this and that's it and other than that I didn't have anything so I just kept on clicking just clicked everything in the editor for a couple of months and after a while you see a system you can see well if I click this then this happens so I mean you start seeing how do I build a level so after a couple of months I made my first level and then you go on from that after a while you get internet you know you, you meet with a lot of people online there are, do the same thing you, you find tutorials I mean your knowledge increases goes faster and faster uh, I got it ended up in mod teams so I started doing modding on my own and at that time I kind of got sick of school so I dropped out of school because I thought making mods was more fun than doing mod so I dropped out of school and uh, then I started applying around in the game industry and it was in 2001 and 2002 I think and back then there weren't many companies yet especially not in Belgium or Holland I'm probably not in Sweden either, so I mean the, the industry was much smaller. So yeah, where, where do you find work? If there were like two companies around in, in an area of like 300 kilometers. I mean it's a lot more difficult, so... Uh, but after a while I got in touch with Streamline Studios. And they just started out, so they were a very startup studio, very beginning. They didn't have a lot of money or anything, but I got in touch with them. And uh, I could do a basic kind of internship there. It was my first somewhat paid job making low poly houses for a race game. So it was the first thing I did that was commercial, making really low poly houses. I'm talking about 100 polygons a house or something or less. So that's a very fun. But it's actually quite fun because then you can just extract textures out of everything. I mean, you have to make textures that are 64 by 64 or whatever. So you can just take a photo or something and extract like 15 different textures from it, which is quite nice. But it was very boring. And then, uh, then I got in touch with Epic and then things started to, to roll. Because I, had a, I, had, uh, I got into the development of Unreal Tournament 2004. And I got in in two different ways at the same time as well. Because and I was in touch with Streamline Studios. They were in touch with Psyonix Studios. And Psyonix proposed a demo to Epic Games. And Epic said, fine, build a demo for us. And if it's cool, we'll buy it. And then Psyonix went to Streamline Studios. And they said to them, well, do you want to help us? Because we can't do this on our own. And then Streamline Studios, because I was working with them, I had experience with Unreal. So I helped Streamline Studios in turn to build the level. So we all built it together. Epic bought the demo and then became Onslaught in Unreal Tournament 2004. So I got in in that way and then Epic contracted me directly after that to build a couple of more levels from that. And at the same time I knew a guy from the community. We'd done mods together. He knew Cliff Blazinski and, Cliff, and he proposed to Cliff Blazinski, look we want to do like a level pack with a couple of people from the community and it's just going to be a, a free pack people can download. But do you want to endorse it? I mean, does Epic want to put like their official label on it? You know, it's just a map pack. And they said, yeah, sure, we want to do that. So we made a couple of levels for Epic and sent them through. And then they told us, well, actually, wait, we'll just buy it all and we'll include it in Unreal Tournament 2004. So I got in a second time at the same time. So that was my start of my real career because I got into the development of Unreal Tournament 2004. I helped Epic Games from home. So as a freelance level designer for like I don't know what it was, nine months or something. And then I applied at Gorilla Games in Amsterdam for Killzone 1 and uh, Shellshock. And I got hired there as environment artist. So then I moved to Amsterdam, worked for them for a year and a month on Shellshock and Killzone. Mostly on Shellshock, but a bit on the cutscenes of Killzone as well. Then I got sick of it and I quit that and I applied to a small studio in The Hague in Holland. I just got started on a new game. And there was an Unreal Engine game. So I was working with Unreal Engine, I love Unreal Engine, so I quit my Gorilla job and I went to the small company so I could work with Unreal and be close to my home in Belgium, because The Hague is a lot closer than Amsterdam. So I moved there, I worked for them for two years, eight months or whatever, and after that I quit and moved to Sweden to work for Starbreeze. 
which I also quit about seven months ago or whatever. So, uh, and I also freela continued freelancing on. In the meantime, I freelanced for WebSend on Huxley for like a year, I think. I made like six or seven arena levels for them. Uh, also Unreal Engine. I freelanced for Digital Extreme on Warpath, also Unreal Engine. And a uh, couple of smaller things. I also go to schools here and there. Uh, I go to Future Games in Stockholm regularly. And I've also been by Playground Squad here in Sweden. Uh, beginning of this month I was, or well, last month actually, I was in Belgium. Actually, no, just three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago I was in Belgium at, uh, uh, and you're affiliated with them, I think. Uh, Kortrijk, Howest, uh, Digital Arts and Entertainment. You are and, and affiliated with them. In any case, I was there three weeks ago. And uh, so, yeah. And I've been by been in, in Gotland a month ago or something, I think, or more, something. So I go to school sometimes. Uh, I started my company a couple of months ago. So I now have my own company in Sweden, who with a couple of people, a small company, but still we have a company. And we're developing our own first game now. So I'm trying to do the, in, after like eight years in, in big companies and big AAA productions, I'm going to try my own smaller indie development project and see how it goes. So we'll see how to, what, that, what happens with that. If it doesn't work out, we'll see what happens. So um, I'm going to talk about my experience in the game industry and how I look at things. And I've been doing this for eight years now, and I saw a lot of things. I mean, I haven't worked for one company for eight years. I really jumped around quite a lot, did a lot of freelance work, met, a lot, met with a lot of people. So I saw a lot of things going on and happen and all that. So we'll talk about that and what's cool about We'll start about what's cool in the industry and then what's bad about the industry, which is the biggest part of what I will talk about. And then a couple of other things, like you want to freelance in the industry. How does it work? And uh, you will probably have a lot of questions yourself. And I had some other things, like a small fee as a large company. You know, what's the good thing about a large company? What's bad about working for a large company as a small company? And all those things. Um, so I will start about What's good about the industry? Well, what's great about the industry is that you get to be a kid all, the day, all, all day long. I mean, I can go to my job and I will talk about uh, spaceships flying over shooting rockets. Yeah. You know, this other guy is going to his job and he's going to talk about how many shares they can buy or whatever, some boring accountancy thing. But I get to talk about spaceships flying over a, a base, building up, uh, blowing up buildings, and then you have a monster coming out and it eats people. And, you know, that's cool. But, uh, <laughs> And uh, it's a young industry. I mean, most people, the average age is, I don't know, 28 by now, I think, 30 maybe. Depends on where you are. If you are in the United Kingdom, the age is older, United States as well, because the industry is more established in those countries, so the average age of the developer is higher. But if you are on mainland Europe, I would say 28, 30 maybe by now, slightly goes up over the years. But I mean, it's a young industry. You don't work with someone who's 50 years old. Or whatever you know it's it's very cool because all the people around you are kind of the same generation you understand each other it's cool um it's also very international it could be a bad thing too we'll get back to that as well but it could be good too i mean it's very international uh if you want to see the world you actually be able to i mean i i could have moved to korea by now australia america canada i mean i could have gone anywhere i ended up in sweden but that aside i mean i could have gone anywhere so if you like to to see the world this industry actually allows you to do that if you're good enough and if you if you have luck of course and all that but still if you like going around you can do it that's cool it's also a, a bad part about it because you I mean you have to move around all the time and I'll get back to that um, it's also a, still a new industry you know if you would go do photography or something or painting or whatever some, some other creative thing they've been doing that for hundreds of years or even longer sometimes you know, all the rules and everything is already defined. It's very difficult to do something new with photo photography. And, you know, because everything is defined, there are very strict rules, like you can't do this or this won't work. And, I mean, it's hard to stand out from the, from the crowd on that, in a way. But with games, they're a lot newer. It's, it's still possible to actually do some new things with games or to really stand out or to really achieve something that's spectacular or new or never been done before. I mean, there's still a lot of potential to grow here, and that's cool. So that's all very good. And of course, you get to do something creative and all those standards things. On the other hand, uh, the fact that it's a young industry also have, have as, as a bad side. A lot of people in the industry have no experience or very little. 
And the average amount of experience slowly goes up. I think it's about three or four, year, four years experience by now, too, maybe. But still, a lot of people in the industry have very little experience. And that's bad, because then lots of stuff is going to go wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, if someone has only made one game before, there's no guarantee that the second game is actually going to be a hit, going to be a hit as well, or delivered on time, or delivered without problems. I mean, there are lots and lots of things going wrong in companies. It's very frustrating, because it goes wrong in every single company. And everyone makes the same mistakes. And also, managers, leads, all those people, they often have just a few years of experience. So a lot of things are really going wrong because of that. Um, uh, is anything more to say about that? So that's definitely an issue. Uh, it's also the international thing. I mean, yeah, it's international, but what if you do want to settle down after you? You're young now, but like maybe in 10 years you actually want to go live somewhere or maybe get kids or something, buy a house or whatever. You can't buy a house. You really can't just buy a house if you work in the industry. Well, you could do it, of course, but there's this really big pressure on you. Because what if you lose your job? You don't just lose your job, you actually lose where you're living. Because you'll actually have to move to the other side of Europe, at least to the other side of the country, unless you're really lucky and there are multiple companies in the same region who are also actually hiring and interested in you at the same time. I mean, it's a small chance. So when I was working for Starbreeze, for example, I moved to Sweden for that. If I would have lost my job at Starbreeze, let's say Starbreeze would have gone bankrupt or whatever, I would have actually had to move out of Sweden probably. I mean, I don't just lose my job, I lose absolutely everything. I lose my house, I lose everything I build up here and I actually have to move somewhere else. That's quite a pressure. You know, and the same in Belgium at some point, before I moved to Sweden, we wanted to buy a house. Because yeah, you, you just want to have your own house. It was a, we found a nice house. So you go talk to the bank and things, can we get a loan and all that stuff. But you can't really do it. Because I can go get a loan for 20 years or whatever. But I'm happy if I can get a job for a year long and actually keep the job for a year long. Because for all I knew, the, know the company probably crashed next year. I mean, I can't get a loan for 20 years. And if I lose my job, then there are almost no companies in, in, in Holland or Belgium. So what do you do? You got a house? You actually, you got money for it. I mean, it's really bad that you, there's no stability and there are so few companies. So if you do want to settle down after a few years, you're basically screwed. Unless you're really lucky, unless you really, really live in a hub. So for example, if you would live in Los Angeles or whatever, then yeah, you can do it. But most people don't, so. And, or unless, of course, you're happy to accept some smaller job. If you're happy to accept a small job, a small company somewhere doing flash games or whatever, yeah, sure, you can probably find something somewhere, I guess. But if you want to do big productions and things like that, you really got to move around. And that's annoying. After a few years, you get really sick of that. Um, and it, I mean, it makes the, the, the choice for a company harder as well. If, let's say my company goes wrong, I will have to find a job again. So I'm going to look around in Europe because I don't want to leave Europe. So where can I go work? I don't just look at the, at the company. I have to look at the, at the environment too, you know? What's the house, the, the house market there? I mean, how expensive is it? What's the quality of living there? I mean, all those things. And then you have to arrange the move. I have to arrange a move from Sweden to another country. You know, and neither, I don't speak either language. Well, I speak a bit of Swedish, that's not the biggest thing. But still, you have to arrange a move to another country. And then you're stuck all on your own in the other country. You have to arrange everything. You have to export your car, import your car, cancel all insurances, everything. I mean, it's such a huge hassle to actually lose your job. It, it, it costs you a lot of money as well. It costs you months of stress and effort. It's really not good once you're settled down. Um, uh, and then another thing, a lot of bad things. So I'll talk about bad things for an hour or whatever. Um, but the thing with games, a lot of games are also delayed. I mean, this is also why you lose your job so much. It's so super volatile. I mean, you can just lose your job any moment, basically. And even when you work for a company like Starbreeze, Starbreeze could be bankrupt by tomorrow. You know, it could happen. And this happened to Grin. Look at Grin. They just, they made... Uh, three or four games, three games, whatever, at the same time released. They got like big new contracts settled. You know, you would say, well, you know, they got huge contracts and they just got three new games on the market. They're going to do great. But then a month later, they're actually bankrupt. You know, it's that super easy to go bankrupt in, a, in this industry. So you actually do lose your job pretty fast. I mean, you always need to get a backup and it's so stressy and kind of depressing. Because no matter how well you do your job, you can still just be fired the next day. It's so annoying. Um, that's the thing, the whole industry, you can just go bankrupt from, from one day to another, basically. 
or the game can be cancelled or the publisher just cancels your game or you can't meet the delivery deadline so you're in for like a huge amount of overtime or whatever I mean lots of stuff goes really wrong also comes from the fact that people are inexperienced you have a lot of new people and those new people I mean they haven't made that many games yet or maybe not, not at all so how, how do those people really know how long is something is going to take I mean lots of mistakes are being made in the management and the scheduling of the projects and that that really influences and in any case it's also very hard to to actually uh, schedule a game because it's a creative process when you start a game you don't actually know what you're going to make maybe you have this awesome design document or whatever but your game is going to change along the way or some things are actually going to be more <coughs> difficult or complicated or somewhere along the way there's going to be someone who says but what if we did this? This would be like five times cooler than the original idea. I mean, this, the thing is going to evolve. And it's very difficult to say at front, okay, this part is going to take exactly three weeks by two people. This part, this, 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 and this. The whole project takes 10 months. Then we throw maybe 20% extra time on top. So the whole project takes 12 months and nothing will go wrong. And in 12 months, we'll be completely be millionaires because we have an awesome game that's going to sell 5 million copies. And it's not going to work out like that. So, I mean, it's very difficult to actually schedule a game because this creative process is going to change along the way and at the same time a lot of people don't actually have, an, have enough experience to do this and even if you let's say you ha you'd have a decent resume and you worked on two big titles as something big I don't know a senior designer or whatever then still you only did the process twice you only went through the process of starting up a game and finishing game just twice that doesn't mean that your third time is going to be flawless you probably still fuck up some parts of it the third time. And then you do have maybe six or seven years experience in making games, but you still have only done it twice. You know, you can still fuck it up, and it, you will. So a lot of people, a lot of producers and whatever, they actually just have a couple of years experience and it goes really wrong at times. Uh, so a lot of games are delayed or they're actually not as good as they're supposed to be because it turns out that they actually had less time to make the game or some things took way longer than they planned. So in the end of the day, they actually had to, they had less time to make the game good and they had less time to polish the game because they spent the majority of the time in making their game actually functional. You know, so a lot of games don't actually meet uh, much what they're supposed to do, you know, level of quality, or they're actually just completely delayed or lots of other problems. So it's not perfect in that way. And also the gamers are just being a lot more demanding these days. People want to have everything, it's impossible. They're one of these awesome huge games and everything has to be absolutely flawless and perfect. You can't do it anymore. And everything has to be super high poly, everything has to be super normal mapped and whatever. It's almost impossible to keep up. The whole system is kind of flawed anyway. Because people want to have these big, tri big AAA games, but the majority of the AAA games never actually make a profit. Because you're spending huge budgets on actually making it perfect and whatever. And but you only need one small little thing that goes wrong and you actually lose all your investment and whatever. I mean, it's very difficult to, to make a profitable AAA title. So I think you're seeing a shift in the market here, but I'll get back to that later, with fewer AAA titles and a bigger, lower segment probably. I'll get back to that later. In any case, um, it's very difficult to estimate a game, so a lot of games go wrong, and because of that you, you can lose your job pretty quickly. Uh, it's also because the way the publisher works with the with developer, so I mean the publisher, they pay the developer an amount of money to make the game and then with that money the developer creates the game, game goes on sale but the developer doesn't actually get any money from the sales. I mean it's very difficult for the developer to build up like a cash reserve in case it goes wrong or in case they don't want to create their own game, you know, without the publisher or without too much investment from a third party. Uh, because I mean the more investment you get from a third party, the more money you get from a publisher, the less money you're eventually going to keep once the game goes on sale because the large majority of your money actually goes directly to the one who invested in you in the first place. So I mean the developer it's very difficult for a big developer like Starbreeze, Starbreeze, like Grin, like any company of that size to be very profitable for a long amount of time and very stable because they can't just build up an amount of cash to back themselves up. It's very difficult for them to really build up a portfolio of products and um, enough cash as protection. Um, because I mean, the f you have a publisher and the publisher says, okay, you get $10 million or whatever to make a game. And of those $10 million, I mean, it takes a year and a half, whatever. Uh, but those $10 million are actually an advance on the royalty that the company would normally get with its game. 
So you don't actually get the money, you just get an advance on your royalty. So you get 10 million, but those 10 million are actually the first 10 million dollar you would have earned through sales. So the first 1 million copies or whatever sold, you don't get anything at all. Because they say, look, we, we gave you 10 million back then, and you're going to pay, pay this back by now. I mean, so the first mil 1 million copies, you don't get anything at all. So it doesn't matter if your game is, has sold 800,000 copies, you don't get anything. You only got the money that you used to make the game, but that money is already gone because you used it to make the game. And then by the time that the game actually passes this recoup point of 1 million copies or whatever, you know, it depends per game, but let's say 1 million copies, by the time you pass the 1 million copies, the game probably went down in price already, so it makes less money even while you did sell above 1 million, or by the recoup point most games just stop. I mean, a lot of games, they're like medium successes. For example, look at Mirror's Edge. Uh, EA Games thought that Mirror's Edge would sell 3 million copies, and that was the okay amount. I mean, it was just expected, and they hoped for more. I mean, 3 million copies, damn it. So they never, they never made that. And uh, this is different because uh, DICE is owned by EA, so it's an internal studio, so it's a different setup, but still. I mean, most games, they don't actually reach a very large volume of sales. So they will get st stuck by about 1 million copies if it's a big, decent game. But that 1 million copies that they sold isn't actually enough to go above the recoup point. So since nothing goes above the recoup point, the developer didn't actually get anything or a very low amount from those 1 million sales, and they end up with nothing. Because the project isn't theirs, they sold the rights to the product, project to their publisher, and they don't have any money from it either. Because all the money that they did have, they invested into actually making the product. So they're basically screwed. I mean, they don't have anything for this. And maybe after a while the game does actually go above it, yeah. But then by then the price has dropped of the, of the game itself. So I mean, the amount of money that every copy brings in goes down as well. So yeah, you don't get rich anymore. Uh, for example, I know for Starbreeze, for example, they made The Darkness, this big game. Everyone knows The Darkness, kind of. I mean, it's a decent ti sized title. But they've never actually made any, any single kroner of money on that, on the sales of that. And the game sell, sold pretty well, because I think the game sold 1.2 million copies or something. And you don't make any money on that. So you can't build up an amount of cash on this. You can't build cash and then say, okay, well, we have this awesome game, sold 1 million copies, fine. Now we have $10 million in the bank, fine. This gives us, like, well, we can do our own game. We can self-fund our own game. And because we self-fund our own game, we can sell it, get even more money from those sales. And you can't do that. So a lot of companies don't have actually have any money at all. So look at Grin, for example. They had three finished products and they go bankrupt within a month because they don't have any backup at all. They, didn't, they made other mistakes as well, but still. So it's very difficult for a company to be very stable. Even if it's a company that's 10 years old, it can still just go bankrupt the other day. So it's very annoying. Um, uh, there's also more and more people getting into the industry these days. When I started 10 years ago, kind of with modding and things, or more than 10 or even, there weren't, weren't that many people. There weren't many companies either, but there definitely weren't many people either. So it kind of, it was imbalanced, and it was a lot more possible to actually get a job without school, without a degree, without experience, without all that stuff that you do need nowadays. So it was, was quite easy to actually get that. For example, I know a guy, and he started in 96 or something, and he was 14 years old at in 1996. And he actually got hired by companies to work from home as a level designer. I mean, the guy was a minor. He was 14 years old, and he got hired by companies who paid him a lot of money to make levels. So he worked on Redneck Rampage games, I think, back in the 90s. And at some point, he actually got hired by Epic Games to make a level for them freelance as well. The guy wasn't even above 18 at that point. So, I mean, that's pretty mad. And he could do that. No one actually ever asked him how old he was. They just gave him money, and he just made a level. You know, and then you, s you can see that it started, you can see an evolution. Because by the year 2000, actually, people did ask about how old are you, you know. And then it sl slowly goes up to a point where we are today, that people want to have, yeah, you must have a school degree, or it's preferable, or a very strong portfolio. Then you must first start by being an intern in our company, you know, and then you can get to be a junior artist or whatever. And you mean, it's a lot, the, the ramp up is a lot steeper. So, um, because when I started, it was normal that you can get a job, like a junior job as your first job. But that was normal. I could just apply somewhere and I would be hired as a junior. It's still a junior, but still I got a real salary. I got everything. It was a normal job. 
but you can't really do that these days anymore. For example, I know last year in Future Games, one of the students, he was really good. He was really much better than the other ones. And uh, I would say he's definitely on, on level with some normal designers. I mean, I mean normal, not junior, not senior, just normal level. I would say he's definitely on level with that, maybe slightly below, maybe slightly between junior and that. But still, he couldn't get a job as even a junior designer. They hired him and they said, well, you have no experience, we'll, we'll get you as an intern. You know, and he can't do anything about it. It kind of sucks because the guy is on level with, with the normal ones. He's definitely good. He should have gotten just a salary for what he does. But it, the, there are so many people around that the companies can get away with just hiring someone as an intern. You know, so there is an evolution there. And in school, I think school is going to become more important as well. And you're going to go through the same evolution that all normal, normal industries have gone through, I think. Because 10 years ago, you could get a job without any schooling at all. There weren't any game development school 10 years ago. So, I mean, a company couldn't really expect you to have any degree in a game development school or anything else. And most people that have worked, that have started 10 years ago, they don't have any degree at all or something completely ir irrelevant. But you can start seeing an evolution in that as well because you get so many people now that companies need to have a way to quickly filter out people from the large group of people. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, well, we just filter out all those people who have a degree and we forget about the rest and then we'll focus on the smaller group and we have and then we'll do a couple of other filters like this guy lives too far away, this is or this, 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 and this. And I mean, they need a way to quickly go through 500 applications, for example. And schooling does become more important for that. The same like for normal industries, you know. For normal industries, the same thing applies. So it's, I don't really entirely like it. I mean, I kind of liked it 10 years ago where it was much more free and much less rigid, just more, you know, if you're good, you get a job. And that does become more and more difficult these days. It's kind of annoying, but you'll have to live with it. And of course, there are way more people too. I mean, back then you, there were like 10 people maybe applying for a job. Now it could be 100, depending on which job, job of course. But still, there are way, way more people. You're probably already completely depressed by now, but <laughs> I had other things. Any questions so far, by the way? Nope. Um, but there are way more people. Makes also makes abuse easy in a way. I mean, well, if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to work 16 hours a day or whatever, I get this other guy, you know, whatever. There are 1,000 people waiting in line, so which is bad, yes. So, I mean, it, abuse in our industry has already been bad since day one because lots, lots of people working in the industry are very passionate. They really like making games, they really like what they do. The uh, majority of the people working in the industry are, um, what's the word, uh, introvert, you know, we don't really speak up easily. A lot of developers, they really, like, real developers, you know, they really just sit at their desk making code and stuff and they don't really speak. So, I mean, it's quite easy to abuse this public, because, I mean, they don't actually say anything. They really like their job, and if they don't like it, there are thousands of people waiting in line. Yeah, so, whatever. If you're a manager, that's quite easy to manipulate. So that's kind of a problem, has been a problem since day one, because people so, so like their job that you can actually ask them, well, do you want to work over for the next four months without extra salary? And they will say, yeah, sure. And you can't do that in any other industry almost. But it's a bit fucked up, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's hard to actually fix that, but still, um, especially if you're a beginner, yeah. I could probably get away with, at some point, just refusing if they ask me, you want to do that, I can just say no, probably. I can probably get away with that. But I mean, if you're a junior or an intern in a company and the company asks you, you, wanna, you should work over for the next three months, what are you going to do? I mean, it's quite hard. You, can't, you could, of course, say no, but then you have implications as well. So I mean, you're kind of in a really bad position there, yeah, which is annoying. So I usually, when I pick a company, I really look, research these things. There are lists online and people that, you know, your, your network of contacts, you ask them what are the conditions in this company. There are also lists online, private lists of companies, you know, blacklist lists made by developers and stuff you can uh, look into. And I can see, well, this company really treated their employees really bad, so I'm not going to work for them, you know. So I really try as much as I can to find a company that behaves properly, but still it's a risk. And it's difficult, especially if you're beginning, it's really difficult to do. Um, so, yeah. 
and it leads to frustration as well. I mean, the more passionate you are about what you do, the more frustrated you're going to get, regardless if you're asked to be worked overtime or whatever, regardless of what happened, the more passionate you are, the more frustrated you're going to get, which is really annoying because the most passionate people usually work the best, but I mean, they're also going to be pissed off the most. So, I mean, anything that happens could be bad. I mean, the more you care about what you do, the more it becomes personal, whatever happens. And since we really like what we do, and really like making games, or really making a level or a character, we really start thinking it personal when someone actually dumps our level. You know, when I worked at Starbreeze, you make a level, it has to be absolutely perfect. You work on the level for three months, and then the producer comes by, and he says, well, we just uh, had a meeting, and we've decided to change the story of the game, and we dropped your level, sorry. You know, I spent three freaking months on that man, you know. And the more you care, the more frustrated you're going to get. And if that happens ten, five times in a row, that they change the story and dump your level, you're going to get really damn frustrated after a while, you know. So the more you care, the more frustrating it gets for everything that happens, and it's kind of annoying as well. But it's, it's definitely a, a sign of, uh, very specific to this industry, because most people really do care a lot about their job. And if they don't, it's a problem as well, so it's never perfect. Uh, after a while, you should just learn to take a distance from your work in order to protect yourself. So I never, I don't really care that much anymore as I used to care, because just to protect myself, you just take a distance, you know, okay, it's my level, but actually, whatever, you know. You need to be somewhere in between whatever, and it's my perfect level, and no one's going to touch it, because otherwise you're not going to survive. Um, you also have... Uh, uh, and then you have small vs large companies. So you got like, a small company has, has different advantages and disadvantages than a big company. And after eight years, they kind of start wanting to only work for small companies by now. But then again, they have a lot of problems as well. If I work for a small company, they can't actually pay me the, m the money I want to have. And they can't pay me for relocating. So, I mean, I might have to relocate to wherever in Europe. They can't pay me. A big company would help me with that. Uh, I know a guy, for example, I mean, when I moved to Sweden, Starbreeze paid my move to here. And I know a guy that went to Canada to work for um, BioWare Edmonton. So he worked for BioWare. He got there and he got a personal assistant for four days or five days, whatever. And it was just a woman walking next to him all day long, explaining to him, well, here we have a phone boot and this is a supermarket. And wait, I will phone so I can uh, arrange a car insurance for you. I mean, that's cool. And you're never going to get that with a small company, of course. So that's the problem. Um, of course, a small company can go even quicker bankrupt than a big company. Because, yeah, of course, a small company has no money at all. So they can really be bankrupt tomorrow, and a big company can be bankrupt next week. But, yeah. Um, uh, then, of course, the uh, problem with a small company as well is that it's more often badly managed. Because people in a small company often have m less experience even than the ones in a big company. You know, the people in a small company, they probably Unless, of course, this company is started by people who have worked in a big company for years, now they want to do their own thing. But most small companies are started by people without that much experience and usually goes even more wrong because of that. So half of them are quite badly managed. Uh, also a problem. Well, at, with bigger companies, I mean, you do have a, a bigger hierarchy usually and it's better structured and you do have more producers. It's slightly more protected and slightly, even while the people there don't have a huge amount of experience either, usually especially in Europe, it's, it's still a bit more protected than a small company, of course. Um, so that's something. Um, but with the advantage of a small company is that it's a lot le less uh, rigid. With a big company, you're much more, more stuck to, like, this is my title. I mean, at the plate on my desk, it says I'm a texture artist, so I make textures. And I'm not allowed to actually touch anything but textures. I mean, it's much more rigid. I do this, and I get only to do this. Well, in a small company, you have the ability to more freelance around, you know. Well, I'm a modeler maybe, but I can actually also do some bit of uh, texture art and maybe do some lightning and some level art. I mean, you spread out because you have a smaller team. It's a lot less rigid. More, most people in the team, it's more, much more real uh, garage development, like, you know, just more like students as well in school. You really help each other out and it's really a small, less defined team, which is also kind of nice. I like that. I don't like being sitting at my desk just doing this or just doing that because my contract happens to have those couple of black letters on, on paper that says I have to do just this and just insane. And I mean it happens at Starbreeze, it happens at DICE too, I know from someone else, it happens at a lot of big companies. If you are at this position, you do this 
and it's sometimes just insane that you can't touch this other thing. It really drives me nuts. I mean, I have nothing. At some point at Starbase, I need a temp texture just as a reference texture, just to show them, OK, well, I have this specific thing here. So I need a couple of textures just to show that it's different and that it does something specific. So I need temp textures. So I thought, well, fine, I make temp textures, you know, and just import them in the game. I know perfectly how and apply the temp textures. But I can't do that, they tell me, because I'm not a texture artist. I mean, come on. And the same thing happened at DICE. I know another guy told me the exact same story. He was a modeler, but he wanted to adjust something. And he can't do it because his contract says he's a modeler. I mean, that's kind of insane. So that's what I do like about small companies. You do have a lot more freedom. And you can just move around. And it, it's a lot. It's cool. I like to multitask. I like to have a varied amount of work. I mean, if I have to do the same thing all day long, I'm going to get really bored. I want to go from lightning to uh, scripting to something else, just switch and things like that which you can't really do at a big company. Um, then again, if you're starting in the industry, maybe a big company is good for you. Because, I mean, then you have a very specific defined position and no one expects you to do all these different things at the same time. I mean, maybe it's kind of easy and good way to start. But after a while, I think it gets frustrating. So. Any questions so far, besides being totally depressed by now? It's, it's pretty bad that you did this on the fifth floor, because people can jump out of the window. You know, so. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, small vs. large company. I mean, large company has a bigger production, yeah. So yeah, you get to work on this awesome AAA title, because everyone says their title is AAA. You know, uh, you can read recruitment posts awesome triple a production built by the world's re-owned uh, game development studio goes into production with a huge budget what do you mean but yeah you get to work on those games but after a while it gets boring too i think I actually kind of likes doing smaller games at this point because i mean most people who want to get work in the industry they're like yeah i want to work on the next god of war or something you know i want to work on the next huge super big title because it's awesome but I don't actually like doing that because you're actually one of the 500 developers or whatever, one on the 100 maybe, 200, and it's just really annoying as well because you're just one this one tiny little screw somewhere in in the huge machine, and you don't have any creative input or you don't have any. I mean, you're just doing mass production basically of assets that six levels above you, a producer have has actually said you should do. I mean, it kind of loses the whole thing about game development and the old. The original feeling, you know, just a bunch of people sitting together making a game together, the old feeling is gone. It's more like a mass production and you may not even know all the people working on the game. You get, you get to work in a big company, you don't even know how the guy, uh, the guy name, the name of the guy that I passed in the corridor, because he works four floors above me on like his specialized UI uh, button program or whatever. You know what I mean? It gets insane. So I kind of lose the touch of that. Then again, I mean, it might be good to start with, because if you start Working on a really big production is the first thing you do. Or you work on a really big company. For example, I went to Epic Games and Guerrilla Games. That helps to get a job after that. I mean, maybe it's not as fun as it should be. And maybe it's, it's big of a bit of a, well, working in this huge machine and just being a small little tiny element in the machine. But it does help getting another, maybe better job after that. It's great to, to start with that. So for that, it's great, yeah. But after a while, I think by now, I kind of get sick with it and want to do something more creative than that. I want to really be creative, not just be like a little, just one of the guys sitting on, on the floor being commanded by a producer. Well, you have to do this now and it has to take exactly this long, it has to look exactly like this. Here are the concept sketches approved by the publisher. Here is the design document approved by this guy and here's this and this and this. You have one week to do this. I mean, that's really boring. I don't want to do that. I want to make my own thing. I want to have some input in the process and all that. So I kind of start moving away from that. Because with a small company, I mean, you can actually do that. They're not going to approve concept art by the publisher, or I mean, the, the whole system is a lot less, is a lot easier and simpler. So I kind of like that approach more. But then again, I mean, if you're a beginning developer, then uh, a big company and a big title is definitely going to help you in the beginning. Yeah. But after a while, I would try something else. Um, 
And then we also have a lot of people want to freelance in the industry. Also comes for that effect. There are not that many companies. So let's say you live, live completely remote or in an area where there are no companies at all. What do you do? And let's say you can't move or let's say you do want to buy a house and want to settle somewhere. So and then a lot of people are like, well, let's go freelance. You know, there are not that many freelance jobs available. I mean, it's not easy to do. I tried to do, try to be a freelancer at some point. And I mean, I did freelance work for Epic, for WebSan, for Huxley, uh, Web, yeah, WebSan, uh, Digital Extreme, and then a couple of smaller projects in between. Then I do the school things and whatever. But still, it's very hard even for me to do this full time and to be, have a stable income. Because I can do this now, but I don't know what's going to happen in, a, in like five months from now. So it's very difficult actually, even for me, to, have, to be a freelancer in the industry, let alone if you're a starter in the industry, to go freelance directly. It's not easy to do. You could be lucky, of course, like with everything. You could just be completely lucky and find an awesome opportunity or whatever, but it's still very difficult to do. Uh, it also depends on what you do. I do level design as prime thing, and level design is like the most central thing in a game, almost, together with some programming and things. I mean, in level, everything comes together in the level. All the gameplay, all the, the programming, all the, the sounds, textures, environment art, everything. So not a lot of companies are actually likely to outsource this most central part of their game to someone outside the team. So it's very difficult to get hold of that. Um, it's also difficult because most of these jobs are, are never advertised. I mean, you can't find a freelance job somewhere on a website. Most of this stuff is going via via or someone who knows someone or all those kind of things. So it's very difficult to get hold of that if you don't know a lot of people or if you don't have a have name online or have a website or somehow manage to attract people, then it's very difficult to do. And on top of that, of course, there are also lots of people. Why the hell would I outsource my work to some guy in Sweden when I can just get a local student who lives next to me in the, in the United States? I mean, why would I do that? I can just get the guy next to me because he can model too. What do you do different opposed to the guy next to you? I mean, why would the company have to go through the trouble of hiring a freelancer on the other side of the world while he can just get a student from his own town? And most people don't have that extra something. So it's, it's very difficult to freelance, I think. I mean, of course, some, some for some things it might work out. And of course, you could be look, lucky, like I said. But still, it's definitely not an easy way to go. Unless, of course, I mean, if you're a programmer, you could also go do non-game things and go into that area, you know, some, I don't know, database programming or whatever. But if you're just a real pure developer, like I do level design, I do, I can only do level design almost. I mean, I can't go do level design for something not games. It only exists in games, so I'm pretty much stuck in that, yeah. And then it gets difficult. Um, it's also the future of the games industry. Because um, we're, we're currently seeing, I mean, you have a lot of big AAA titles, but like I said, a big AAA title takes a huge investment, uh, $10 million or even 20, 30, some titles even $50 uh, million, I mean, it's absolutely huge. And it's almost impossible to recoup that money, especially as a developer as well. Uh, also, by the way, just while well, I think about it, what I said about small vs large companies working on small products, small games and, and big games, so also the thing with a big game is, I mean, it's going to take three or four years of your life making the game. That's mad, because if you, you spend four years of your life making this game, it, you put lots of effort into it, and for all you know, it probably crashes maybe the day after. I mean, maybe it never sells anything. Maybe everyone hates it. You lost four years of your life on that. And of course, it's just a job and you got paid for it, but still you do care about what you do. So you do actually, you, you spend four years of your, your energy and your love basically into this game, and then no one buys it. That's very frustrating as well. Um, so that's why I do like smaller games. The risk is smaller. You know, you could spend six months on the game. Maybe it doesn't sp uh, sell, but hey, I just lost six months. It's still bad, but I, I can do something else after six months. If you work on a game for three or four years, it's going to get really, really boring. You know, you go to work every, every day for four years long to discuss the same character doing the same thing in the same few levels that you already discussed 16 times before. That's just really boring after a while. Um, but that's also, I mean, the risk of a small, uh, big title. You have this huge AAA title, it costs maybe 20 million to make, and then you just hope to sell three or four million copies. When I started 10 years ago, and you would, if you sell one million copies, you were like doing super awesome. You know, one million copies. And these, day com 
these days companies expect to sell uh, 5 million copies to get a good result. And yeah, the industry has grown, but there are limits too. The type of games, the type of really AAA titles, they're still very specific to a specific audience, which is around a male person between 16 and 25 to 30, year, 30 years old. I mean, there are not that many people that are actually fit that category, that are also interested in your game, also have a Xbox 360, also, I mean, it's not, the, the audience is not that big. It's still not a really big mainstream product games. Because not all the people on, on, on in society like to play these games. It's still a specific small part, and the part is growing because people get older. And I mean, the gamers of today, in 10 years, are still going to like games, so it's slowly going to start to grow. But still, it's, it's kind of a small audience, and it's difficult to recoup a $50 million, do $50 million investment. If you look at Killzone 2, for example, I know they started working on it when I left in 2004, I think it was. Uh, that's when they finished Killzone 1, and r immediately after that they started on Killzone 2. And so they started back then. I know they had at least 150 people. So uh, by now they probably have 150 to 200 people. So let's say you have 200 developers for four years long, and uh, they have a really big building in the, in the middle of Amsterdam. It's really expensive, I guess, because, I mean, it's the most expensive area there is. So if you, if you count up all, all those salaries, then Killzone 2 must have indeed cost about 40 to 50 million dollars to make. Oh, fuck, say, 40 million. And it's only one platform. It's only PlayStation 3. And what has, what has Killzone 2 sold? I don't know, 1 million, maybe 2 million, but even with 2 million copy, and if you deduct all the costs, you still don't recoup 50 million, 50 million dollars. So, I mean, it's so incredibly difficult to recoup your money. And there are only a couple of games that actually manage. I mean, Gears of War probably managed, God of War probably managed, uh, I mean, of course, uh, Modern Warfare probably managed. But below all these super big titles, there is a very large group of titles that have tried, but have completely not recouped their money. They're actually making a loss. So the whole, the whole focus on big AAA productions is actually kind of shifting, I think, down. Because a lot of people kind of, they get aware of the risks. Less and less companies actually want to do it. If you look at the strategies from Activision and EA, all the big publishers, you can see that they they start, they, they, they kind of uh, start up sm less big games. They adapt, uh, adopt a new strategy, which is, well, we're just going to do five really big productions this year. We're going to give them lots of money, rather than doing 20 rather big productions. So we're going to give just a few p games a really big budget, and going to push this really, really hard, but we're not going to touch anything else. Because again, I mean, they can't just... It, it gets so much more difficult to sell big AAA games and, and make a profit. We saw this happen in, in 2008 as well, the end. Or 2009, I think. No, 2008, yeah. I mean, suddenly you had this huge amount of games being released in, in around uh, September, October, November, and December. You know, and suddenly a, a number of these games didn't sell anything, along with Mirror's Edge. You know, they had way too many games at the same time, and suddenly the market seems to have hit its roof. Suddenly, I mean, people have always thought the games industry ke keeps on growing, and every year more games will be sold, because our statistics say so, and suddenly it didn't happen. Or maybe it happened, but there were so many games being released at the same time, with so much marketing money thrown behind it, that a number of those games didn't actually reach the number they had hoped for. Because, I mean, there are just way too many games at the same time. So the market has started to fix itself now. Uh, fewer big titles, uh, along with the recession that happened anyway. So I mean, the recession caused that a lot of publishers didn't really uh, sign a lot of new projects. So I mean, the number of big projects is going down. And at the same time, the rise of the indie games is going up, I think. Because they have more and more smaller productions, like the game I'm doing as well, and everything in that, that category. Uh, look at Battlefield 1943, I think. Uh, Battlefield 1943, it's Xbox Live Arcade only, I think, or maybe PlayStation Network too, I don't know. In any case, they sold a lot. They sold one million copies, I think, or whatever. I mean, they sold a record. And it's, it's a smaller game. They didn't invest 30 million in making Battlefield 1943. They still make a lot of money on it. This is the new group of games that's starting to rise up. Smaller budgets, but you still have a lot of potential, and you can actually make a healthy profit on it. It's much less of a risk, and if it does go wrong, you just lost one year. You didn't lose five years, you lost one year and maybe 50 people development, 20 people, 10 people. So, I mean, the investment is much smaller, but you can get a lot of money back in return. So, I think that this segment is going to go up, and the really big game is going to go down slowly. 
uh, because it's the only way th that the market can survive. Uh, that also the whole shift to digital distribution we are having, I think it's also influenced. I mean, the indie games, you can actually be an indie developer, what I'm doing. You can actually quit your job, make a game, sell the game and be rich, I hope. I mean, you can actually do that these days, which is cool. You couldn't do this uh, 10 years ago because there were just no ways of getting your game to the public. The internet wasn't that well developed 10 years ago. And the only way to actually, there was no digital uh, distribution platform like Steam 10 years ago. The only way to get your game to the gamer uh, was in the shops with a normal CD box and CDs and things like that. And that you just couldn't do on your own. You just need to have a publisher for that who can manufacture the CDs, distribute them, talk to uh, distributors in every country, talk to shops and getting your game set up. So, I mean, but these days you have Steam, you have uh, Direct to Drive, you have Impulse, you have lots of those networks. You have Xbox Live Arcade, of course, you have PlayStation Network. I mean, you can actually make your game, sell it and get money from it without the help of a publisher. So that's cool that this is happening, but I do think that it's going to stop in a couple of years because the market is going to fix itself and you're going to see... I mean, if you look at iPhone, there are lots of junk games. I think there are over 25,000 games on iPhone or whatever. That, and in any case, tens of thousands of games on iPhones. 99% of those absolutely suck, you know, because everyone can release a game on iPhone. So if there is no platform protection, everyone is going to release a game on it, which in turn is going to damage uh, the market. Because if you have 99% of the games are crap, then why would you attempt to buy a game for an iPhone? Because most of them suck anyway. So I mean, most people are not going to buy a game anymore if they if they already bought 15 games before and all and 14 of the 15 sucked, you know. So uh, what we see with, for, I mean, to release a game on, on the Xbox Live Arcade or PlayStation Network, you need to get permission from Sony or Microsoft. You can't just release your game on it. You can't just go to Microsoft and tell them, look, here's my game, I want to release it. Here's the the copy. Have fun. I mean, they actually have to approve what you do. And if they don't, it's like a, a quality check. If they can't, they have to check if your game is good enough to protect your own platform. If they say that your game isn't good enough, I mean, if the game is really bad, then that might hurt their reputation. So they will make sure that all the games that get released meet a minimum level of quality and are allowed in by them. Um, so it's, it's not that easy to actually release games on Xbox Live Arcade or whatever. And the same might happen on other platforms. It could be that Steam does the same thing at some point. In any case, you can't just tell Steam, I want to sell my game either. Steam has to approve you. It's not as harsh as, as Xbox Live Arcade or whatever, but they still have to actually allow you into the system. And a lot of developers, they email Steam and they never get a reply or Steam just says, no, no, I'm not interested, sorry. So, I mean, you can't just go to Steam and, and tell, ask them to get release your game. And they do this for the same reason. If they would allow everyone in, then it would be flooded by complete crap and no one would like Steam anymore. Same for the other platforms. So there's a protection going on and I think that because of the rise of the indie games, there are going to be more people doing what I do right now. And that's making drone small games. So this is completely going to boom. So you're going to get a huge amount of games in a, in a year from now or maybe two or whatever. It's already happening anyway. A huge amount of games. Um, that are about all the same price, the same size, same level of quality maybe. And then the people are going to have a need a way. I mean, how does the public know which one of these is good enough? You know, if you have 1,000 games released a year, not everyone is going to buy all that. I mean, it's going to start filtering it out. You're going to start seeing protection being implemented by, by platforms like Steam. And slowly it's going to become more and more difficult to actually make your own indie game. So I think the market is going to protect itself again. And I think that slowly it's kind of the gates are closing. So that's also one of my, I want to make my game now and try to get it on Steam and all other places because if I can get my game out now, I can get my foot into the door and I think that the market is going to close in the next few years so that at least I got my foot in the door and that will probably help me in the next five or ten years, I hope. So that's the idea. I think it's really the smaller games are also going to close and they're going to grow in size. I mean, when Xbox Live Arcade started and whatever, uh, most games released on that were made by just individuals or very small teams, very small budget. Because the big publishers, they had something like, oh, well, I don't know about this whole Xbox Live Arcade thing. Let's just wait what happens. See, just, just wait and see what happens. And maybe it becomes good, maybe not. So they left the platform alone. And instead, Microsoft went on to talk to smaller developers because they were actually willing to help them. So the smaller developers, they gave the products to Microsoft Live, Live Arcade. It became a big indie platform, really good for your first game or whatever. 
And then by now we can see that the smaller games that the first group of developers made, they've sold so many copies, some of them, that the big, big publishers are convinced by the success and now they are step stepping into it as well. So they're stepping into it. You can see with Battlefield 9043, you can see bigger productions being made for that platform. And slowly, Microsoft is saying to the smaller developers, indie developers, well, I'm sorry, we're not interested anymore because we just signed, already signed a deal with Ubisoft, Microsoft, and all the other big ones. So we're not really interested in your small game, sorry. So you can see that as the big ones step in, they start filling up the void and they start restructuring it. So I do think it's gonna, the market's gonna close. And in any case, it's, it's a lot harder to, uh, I mean, if, if EA makes a big Xbox Live Arcade game, you can't fight that. They have a lot more manage, uh, marketing, they have a lot more contacts and all that. I mean, it's, it gets difficult again to fight that. So, unfortunately, I, I think the whole indie thing is, is somewhat temporarily, maybe. Um, so we'll see in any case, maybe not. But there will definitely have to be a system implemented in the next few years that restructures this and protects the market and those kind of things. So, but we'll see. Uh, any questions? Hmm? Uh, <coughs> what do you think uh, is the easiest uh, platform to um, publish your game on? Like, is it the PC or...? Yeah, uh, PC, of course, yeah. Or iPhone, but yeah. I don't think you want to do iPhone. That's the thing, I mean, iPhone, a couple of years ago, was really popular. Because again, it's a new platform, not many people on it yet. Then one guy makes a game, gets hugely popular, and then everyone is like, oh, the guy got some, became a millionaire, let's all go make face, uh, iPhone games. And then everyone jumps on iPhone, uh, which causes 1,000 games to be made every week or whatever, up to a point where no one actually makes any profit at all anymore. And now we can see the same thing happening with uh, Facebook. Suddenly you have like Farmville and the other one, I forgot the name. And it became really successful, and now everyone is like, "Ooh, I want to do Facebook games because then I'm going to get completely super rich," you know. So, and then you can see the same problem because if you're going to do a Facebook game now, you're not going to make money anymore, probably, because everyone is doing it at the same time. Um, but other than that, it's PC is the easiest, yeah, because PC is an open platform. You don't actually need permission from anyone to make a PC game. You do need permission to get on Steam or whatever, but you could technically do it without Steam. You don't really, really need it. Uh, while with Xbox and PlayStation, you really, really need to have permission, or you just can't do it. Same for Nintendo. So, yeah. Whatever, World War II or whatever, I don't think it's that bad. So, um, because for example, a lot of people think, well, if, if one million people pirated my game, I lost one million sales, but you can't really say that. You might have lost 50,000, whatever. I mean, if it's free, you people, a lot of people just get downloaded anyway. So, of course, it doesn't help, but I don't think it's the, the major thing. What I read, actually, before I, I went to Gotland a couple of days ago, I read on a private industry forum a discussion from, from someone. And I actually think this is way more damage. I forgot all the numbers that he presented. But uh, uh, game rentals, for example, are way worse, actually, I think. And they're actually, it's way worse because those people really make money on your, on your stuff. Um, for example, he was, I don't know, from the UK or America or whatever, they have a shop there, a big shop, uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in Sweden, but a big, uh, lots of shops selling, selling games. And it can actually return your game to the shop, second-hand it, and then sell it again, you know, could do the same thing in Sweden, I guess. So, so that's rental, uh, that's selling it second-hand, and you also have rentals. And he said, well, the, the, the new games were like $50, and right next to the new games, there was the same game, second-handed, for $49. But th those $49, if, if they sell that copy, those $49 go directly to the shop. It doesn't actually go to the publisher, it doesn't go to the developer. Every second-handed copy is sold, all the money goes 100% directly to the shop. So they're really, really annoying and really bad. I mean, if you, he said, if I buy a game in a shop, then the shop tells me that if I complete the game, I can bring it back to them and I will get half the price back from them. So I can just, it's basically a rental. I can play the game and a week later I can return the game to them and get half my money back. I get $25 back and then they are going to sell my second-handed copy for $49. Because it's $1 cheaper and a lot of people actually go for the $49 instead of the $50 copy. But I as a developer, I never get any money from that. And the next guy that buys, they're going to tell him the same thing. So you might actually lose 10 sales on that. 
and while the, the shop the shop makes 10 times what is it at least $20 per copy extra so they make $200 on your game and you made maybe $10 on the first copy so you made $10 they made $200 at least and I think that's way way worse than pi piracy actually but it's a lot less discussed because it's not as evil most people think so and the same goes for rental I mean you can rent a game but the, the, the money that from renting a game goes directly to the person that rents it out. It doesn't actually go to me as developer. I, I get nothing from people renting my game. And that's kind of messed up, I think. So I think that's worse, actually, than piracy. Doesn't mean you have to pirate my game, but yeah. Hmm. Maybe everything that's kind of that everyone does. I mean, everyone is a modeler almost. How many modelers are there on on the planet? A lot of people want to be a modeler. I mean, it's a lot of less less people are scripter. You know, if you if you're a very specific have a very specific activity, it's maybe easier to get a job. Of course, there are also less company interested in you, but you have a very specific something that stands out from the mass. If you just say I'm a modeler, then the company will say, well, yeah, we have 500 other people who have applied as modeler. So we'll add you as number 501 and we'll contact you in about 16 years, you know. So I think that actually the, the most normal jobs are perhaps the hardest to get, I think. The more specific it is what you do and the more, yeah, if you have really good specialization, for example, I, my specialization is Unreal as well. I mean, it's Unreal. So I can go to a company, I can tell them, well, look, I have 11 years experience in dealing with Unreal Engine. I made five Unreal Engine games. I can really make a difference for your production. That helps me. That's a lot better if I would go to the company and say, look, I'm a level designer. Uh, well, I, I did make a lot of uh, big games, but I'm still just a level designer, you know? So. Yeah? Is it common that people uh, sort of regret their career choice and get out of the game games industry after five years? Yeah, a lot of people do that, actually. So a lot of people, yeah, after five to ten years, you kind of get sick of it, 15 years maybe. I think maybe you get a, maybe five to ten year. I think if you survive ten years, you probably stick around, I think, I would say. But a lot of people indeed, they get frustrated after a while for all the reasons I said. You know, every company goes wrong for the same reason. Or you work on, on a game, you put all your love and your energy into the game. You work day and night on the game and then the publisher just says, uh, oh, well, sorry, you're not really interested anymore or whatever. I mean, I worked for the small Dutch company I worked in 2004. Their, their first game and their previous game they worked on, they had a deadline from the publisher to create, finish the game. So they worked day and night for months long, overtime, finishing, trying to finish the game. And then they delivered the game on time. It was finished. They were really happy. We made it. And then a week later, the publisher notifies them that they say, well, actually, the game doesn't really fit our uh, strategy anymore. We're going to postpone it and we're just going to shelf it for a year. But we'll release next year. You know, <laughs> it's so super damn frustrating. And that happens a lot. Lots of those things happen a lot. I mean, this is what I said about Starbreeze. I worked for months on a level and then the producer says, sorry, we changed the story there. You, your level is out. I mean, so after a while, yeah, you actually go look for other work, yeah. But then again, it's, it's difficult to do anyway, especially if, you, if you're not too... If, if you're a programmer, you can just do anything almost. You know, you could do some other type of programming. Maybe it's not as interesting. Maybe you have to reschool yourself a little bit, but it's doable to program something other than games. But if you're a level designer or you don't, you're something very specific, what are you going to do? If you're a modeler, maybe you could go into architectural visualization or the movie industry or whatever. Maybe you could do something like that. But if you do very specific things, it's much more difficult. So in my, my, uh, for me, I'm personally stuck. So I can't really do anything else. But a lot of people do want to quit here after a while. I would say a considerable amount, 20 or 30 percent maybe. And some return after a while, perhaps. So, so again, but again it's, it's also about how passionate you are about what you do. I think the less passionate you are actually may help you survive. So, yeah. Yeah. What do the most of the people that quit, what do they start working with after? They do normal... Or game industry or no, normal programming, or yeah, flash games or smaller games, poker games, you know, those kind of things. 
or indeed programming, you know, administration, I mean network programming or things like that. Websites and everything surrounding it. That kind of thing. Teaching. <laughs> so, yeah. Is there any uh, developer or publisher that is notorious for being assholes towards the uh, developing studio? Well, uh, Activision was the last one who uh, came in the news. But all the big ones that have been in the news before. I mean, it's not, not just them. But I mean, Activision, the last few years, is definitely the new EA. I mean, EA was very unpopular five years ago, and they changed quite a lot, and they're doing a pretty okay job now, but Activision took over. I mean, I know a lot of quads from, uh, what is it, Botic or whatever it's called, his name, Activision guy. And he says, like, uh, what is most famous quads game shouldn't be fun. It should just be, I mean, something else, or it's just about the money or whatever, I mean. And there were lots of story from, uh, uh, a lot of stories from Activision surfacing that's really bad. I mean, every big publisher has this basically. And it also depends from uh, development company, a development studio to studio. You know, it could be that working at DICE in Stockholm is really good, but that working at some EA studio somewhere in Los Angeles is really, really crappy. So. Hmm? Anything else? Nothing? Yeah? yeah? I was thinking about the, the game stores taking a lot of money yeah. from the uh, news games. Are we going to see a lot more uh, uh, games sold on internet uh, stores? Yeah. Or yeah, probably. Or some other kind of hybrid system, I guess. You have, you have uh, things like uh, on live streaming games and things. You can actually rent that out pretty good. I mean, you can say if you pay. Uh, this much you may play the game for 10 hours, for example. You could rent out a game in an official way, benefiting the developer. So I think we'll see something like that happen. And of course, uh, more games sold online to prevent that. And what we also have these days is downloadable content and things like that. So per copy that you purchase, you get like a lot of stuff for free on top. So if you buy the copy, you get a code with the game, and then you can use this code once to download some add-on for the game. So the people who buy the game, they get a free add-on, but the people who don't buy the game, they actually have to buy this code if they want extra content, which they probably will because the original game probably sucks. But I mean, that's probably the direction it's moving into. So you have to, so you get a code with the game, so you basically buy a demo, and if you uh, want to unlock more, you still just have to enter the code in onto a website on the internet or whatever, and it will unlock more of it. Something like that, perhaps. That's the current tactic. I don't know if it's going to work. So. Anything else? Yeah. There's not many new small companies in these two years, last year in Sweden. Yeah. How do you think they're gonna go? Do you think gonna still be alive in five years? No, probably not. Actually, but it's that most small companies they they don't live long. I mean, a couple of them survive, survive, and they become the next Starbreeze or Grin or whatever, just like they started ten years ago. But m the majority of them stays either very small, and that's not good either, because I mean that doesn't really give you any. I mean, for you as students, I mean, that's not going to give you a job. And I mean, it goes for my company too. We can't afford hiring someone, so yeah, doesn't help. Um, and the majority of companies, I mean, it's just so hard to make money in this industry anyway. So yeah, I think a lot of them will actually crash. And just maybe a couple of them, half of them might survive in some way, perhaps. But still. But the, the Swedish industry is kind of weird anyway, because you have a couple of really big companies and then you have absolutely nothing below that, and then you have like a huge amount of really small companies. But it's very imbalanced because you have you do have a, a, a decent number of big ones, but then you also have a huge, huge number of really small ones, and there's nothing in between. Normally, there are some mid-sized companies in between that are on their way to become big or whatever, but you have nothing in between in Sweden. It's kind of weird, and it kind of makes it hard, I think, on the industry in, in general too, because everything relies on just these three or what is it, big companies. And if one of them goes down, then you suddenly lose 20% of your industry or whatever with Grin. You know, that's suddenly yeah, like a major blow to your industry. So what would benefit Sweden, I think, is if there were more mid-sized companies, about 30, 
50 people or whatever, something like that. So. Anything else? Yeah? When we go out to look for our first job in the industry, is something in particular that we should be wary of? Um, yeah. Well, in, in any case, I mean, it's, it's difficult anyway. If you're a starter, I mean, you can't make high demands, I guess. And I know when I started in the industry and I went for my interview at Gorilla Games or I went to Streamline 2 and whatever, and they're like, do you have any questions? And I'm like, no, I don't have any questions. I just want a damn job, you know. But if I go to a company now and I have like half a Bible of questions with me and I better hope for them that they can answer those questions in a nice and fitting way, you know. So after a while, I mean, when you start, you're mostly concerned, I want to have a job. And then after a while, you, do, you learn, oh, well, actually, this sucked about this company. I don't want to do this again. And oh, this sucks as well. And this sucks and this and this. So and when you go on an interview after a few years, you're like, well, I don't want to, how do you handle this, this, and this, and this, and this? And you have a huge amount of questions. But in general, you want to make sure they don't abuse you. I mean, I would ask about overtime, how they do that. Is it compensated? How much does it happen? Things like that. Um, a lot of hidden, hidden things you can look at. I mean, if a company doesn't allow you on the floor, so they don't actually show you the people you're working with, they don't actually show you where you will be working, it's usually pretty bad, because I mean, what do they have to hide? So that's usually pretty bad. Uh, you can also just, I mean, how the guy behaves, the interviewer, those kind of things. I mean, a company interviews you, it's not just interviewing you, you're interviewing them as well. They have to convince you as well, it's not just the other way around. So, um, what else? Well, I look at, at how fast they reply, I guess. I mean, if it takes a company a month to reply my email, then no thank you. Uh, my, my record stands at I emailed a company. They were freaking in Holland. They were freaking 50 kilometers away. How hard can it be? I mean, it was next door. They were working with Unreal. I was working with Unreal. You could email me back, maybe. And they replied me 18 months later. And they asked me, hi, we're interested. Do you want to come for an interview? No, no, really, sorry, that was 18 months ago. So I mean that the speed at which they reply is important for me. Um, and then general impression, of course. Uh, yeah, how, how is the office? I mean, a lot of companies these days have open plan offices, which I don't like either. But it seems to be the new hype. It's, it costs less for the company as well. I mean, it, it costs less money to make less walls because it's just open space. Just put uh, uh, desks in a big open space and you're done. And it's supposed to help make the team more social, they say. Because if you have a big open space, everyone working in the same space, everyone's going to talk with each other and it's going to be one big happy family. Well, what actually happens is that no one actually talks, especially in Sweden, because you're all very silent. But what happens in Sweden is, and in other countries too, no one talks because no one dares to talk. Because if you talk, you're going to disturb the programmer four meters away. So no one actually talks anymore. So it actually makes it worse than making it better. Um, so I look at open plan offices, I look at just general atmosphere. Um, yeah, it depends per company anyway. When I moved to Starbase, I looked at, do they want to pay my move? Uh, how are they with me doing work besides their hours? I mean, if I want to do my own little game or something, how are they there with that? Um, uh, overwork, I really pressed for that. How do, we do, how do you handle overwork? Uh, how much does it happen? How much has it happened on your last game? How did that went? What is your ambition for the future? What is your vision on overwork? Do you really think it's necessary, um, necessary for uh, the creation of a game? Or do you think it's something that you rather avoid? Uh, is it compensated? How is it compensated? What's the maximum? All that. So uh, That's, I think, that's the most important part. And then, of course, I guess as well, I mean, what I said, can I make a model if I'm a level designer? Or do I really have to stick to my, my role? Then again, every interviewer will say, yeah, sure, you can do it. And then three months later, you find out you can't do it. But still, <laughs> you can at least try to ask and see what they say. Um, yeah. Anything else? Yeah? Why did you start working in Starbase? Why did you quit? I mean, that story. I started because, um, well, first of all, I mean, I was working at Kaon Games. I was a small Dutch studio. And I wanted to quit that because I started in 2004 and by 2007 we're still working on the same game, which was the MMORPG, 
we did actually finish it, it was a complete miracle, because I mean, we had like just a few people, and during productions we also had trouble with the producer, we all hated the producers, lots of problems in the team, lots of war within the team, I mean, it's a complete miracle that we actually finished the game, but I got really sick of it, because I mean, it's not good. So I quit that position, because I thought the whole team, I mean, the whole thing, it wasn't working out, and then I started looking around, and I ended up in Starbreeze, yeah, because it's, uh, the location is great, I mean, in Sweden, it's better than, than going to live in London, downtown London or something. I mean, it's nice, Sweden, nice environment, high quality of living. I like nature, so this is a pretty good place to be here. Um, and it's a small town. I don't like big cities. I don't like London. I don't like Paris or anything all too big. I don't like Amsterdam either. So it's nice that Starbreeze was in a small town. You can't find it in this industry almost. It's very difficult to find a company that's not in this huge, mega big city. So it, was not, it definitely was a big plus for me. Being in Sweden, being in a small small town, Uppsala is the perfect size, I think. You get everything you need. It's not too big, not too small. It's perfect. And then the company as well. They did FPS games. I do FPS games. Perfect match. They do my kind of games, you know, story, story based, atmospheric games. Fits me perfect. Um, they have a very traditional FPS view, you know, they're really FPS origins. So, I mean, I have that as well. It's, it's perfect as well. Uh, they're successful still. And they're, they're a perfect match between not a big company, not a small company. They do have the money of a big company somewhat. I mean, they have enough stability of a big company. And they're not a small company either. They're, they're nice mid-sized. So that was great. They have a lot of, of big games, you know, The Darkness, Riddick, and their new stuff now. So their productions are really good, well-known, and yet it's a small, cozy company. So it was perfect. So that was why I went for them. And I talked to a guy as well. I, I, I knew a guy in Sweden and he knew the lead character artist at Starbury, so I talked to him first and checked what he said and all that. And so I got to for Starbury for an interview, they hired me and I worked there for a year and, I don't know, eight months or something. And then I quit, yeah, because uh, first of all, I wanted to do my own game. So I just got sick of it and just wanted to do my own game. game. Uh, and uh, the production of the game I was working on wasn't just really going very fluently. So I kind of got sick of it. So when I started working at Starbreeze in, I don't know when it was, I think early, I don't know, 2009, I think now, 2008, I don't know. When I started working at Starbreeze, uh, I started working on the new game right away. So they were still working at Riddick at that time, but when I joined the team, I was the first level designer on their awesome new, still unannounced game. And uh, I worked on that game until I quit. But we, the, the game was restarted like four or five times. They just dumped the story and they just dumped it, the whole idea, and they just did, okay, well, actually the last one wasn't that, that good, so let's just start over. And all the work I had done in a year and a half or whatever was just thrown away. So the only thing I have in the, in the game that I have right now, I think, is a skybox or something. I mean, I made a skybox in a year and a half. So that's what I mean with the big company and and being frustrated. So I got really frustrated from that and I just quit. And I went on doing my own thing. I had my own thing as backup anyway, so I, I looked into that, I worked out my backup, I made sure that my backup was, was well planned, and then I quit and I moved over to my own stuff. And that's where I am now. So we'll try that. So, but their game is really cool that I've been working on, but it's, it's, it's a shame that it doesn't really go fluently, and they know that, but they try to fix it, but I don't want to try it for them. It's their problem, so, yeah. So when you parted with Starbreeze, did you part on good terms? Like, if you would apply to get back on Starbreeze, do you think they would accept you, or...? I don't know. Maybe it was decently good terms, yeah. Of course, they're not happy that I just do my own thing now. Well, they're, I mean, they're not, not super angry either. I mean, it's just, it's annoying for them, of course, if someone leaves. So in that case, it's annoying, but other than that, we're fine. And for them it's good too, there are more companies in Sweden. Because it's good for them if, if this industry in Sweden is, is going well, if there are lots of people working in it, if, if, if everything is going well. And if Sweden is promoted internationally as a regional region of game development, that's all very good for them. So in that way it's a good thing for them. But of course if someone leaves it's not good for them. Because they have to go hire someone new and all that. Uh, but other than that, I might be able to return, I don't know. But I don't want to anyway, so. And when I quit, it was when Grin uh, went bankrupt. That was when I handed in my notice. So they had a lot of people to pick from anyway, so they weren't really bothered. 
They were like, oh, fine, we'll take someone from Grindon. So, it was fine for them. Anything else? There must be something. You're going to work in the industry. What do you want to know? What don't you know? Otherwise, you can all just start tomorrow. Yeah. Um, how well does these jobs pay? I would just say normal, average. What an average person in general and also in the whole of society earns, I would say, yeah. Just normal. It's not bad. N normally, it's not, it's not bad at all. But it's not good either. It's just you can pay your bills. You can live your normal life. You can get a car, maybe. You can just do your normal stuff. That's it. So, um, and of course, if you go for a smaller company, you probably don't even have that. So, that's the thing. Um, but it's, yeah, a very normal salary. That's it. It's very difficult to get really rich on this. I mean, you don't, shouldn't expect to get rich on this. Uh, and like I said, if, even if you make a really big game and your game sells and you sell like 4 million copies, you still probably won't get money from your game. So, I mean, and, and some companies like Starbucks, they have a royalty agreement. So if the game sells this many copies, then they will share, I don't know how many percent it is, but X percent to all the employees. So then you get X percent divided by how many employees there are, and that's your bonus for making the game. But then again, like I said, it's very difficult to actually go above the recoup point, and it's even more difficult to go above the recoup point to up to like multiple million copies. So it's high enough above it, so it's enough money generated for the company that when divided by 100 employees or more, actually is something that's meaningful for you. So before that happens, you have to sell 4 million copies or whatever. And so it's a very small chance you will actually make money after the game goes on sale. So it's basically just your salary. Yeah, you can just normal normal life. But it's not, not good enough, I think, because I mean, the game, the industry is so super volatile. I mean, it just crashes. Lots of companies just crash. I want more money, because if the company crashes, I'm stuck in a foreign country. I want to be compensated. I want a higher salary to compensate for that, because it's insecure. But yeah, of course, you can't really ask them for that, but still. You, you can't trade it like a normal salary, I think. And uh, also, if they want to have overtime, a lot of companies, they say, well, you, want, you have to work over because you have to finish the game. But no, I don't really have to finish the game. Why would I have to finish the game? I mean, I do have to care for my game, of course, but that's what I said. You don't want to care too much. I don't really have to finish your game because you're just paying me for my time. You're paying me for eight hours a day. I don't have to finish your game. Because even if I, I put in like 60, uh, week, 60 hour weeks, I'm not going to get anything for your game goes on sale. Once the game goes on sale, then the, the owners and the publisher and whatever, they're going to get money. But I'm just not going to get anything on that. And usually it's just not worth the effort to work over. And that's kind of hard. And it's very cold, but it's the truth. And a lot of developers discovered that after they went through a couple of these periods. I can work 60 hour weeks, the game goes on sale, it sells 2 million copies, and I get nothing for it in return. Or maybe I get like a couple of 10,000 kroner in bonus, woohoo. You know, so no, I won't, won't work over to finish your game. It's not my, my thing. You pay me for this many hours. It's your responsibility to schedule me in an efficient way so I can get the most out of my hours. If you can't do this, your problem or you offer me more money. Of course, I mean, there are, you can't be that harsh either. You know, sometimes you do want to go uh, uh, help them and you do want to work over a bit. But I'm never going to work over for three months nonstop because they say you have to finish the game. No, I don't. It's not my game. I, I'm just being paid to make your game. If you want me to work over, you, can get, you will have to give me a share. So I actually have a benefit of working over, or you will have to compensate me for my overtime. So, yeah. But then again, I mean, if you just start out and it's your first job, you can't really say that, <laughs> I guess. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and the overtime is, is th this guy from last year, student at Future Games, really good. He eventually got a job in German company. And I mean, the, the company is fine, and he's one of the best, he's the best intern they ever had, they said, which I imagine. And so they asked him to do the E3 demo, yeah. And he's like really super happy because he, he feels really important because he gets to do the E3 demo as intern, you know. But for the company it's easy because they have a really good guy who do not even have to pay, or they pay him a little bit, I mean, I think like a few thousand kroner a month, but I mean, it's nothing for a company. So for them it's easy. But the problem is the guy has to work over 
like 60 hours a week he, in total he works or more so he's working over 60 hours a week he started doing this in March 1 and E3 is June 15 so if he already started working over March 15 and E3 is in June 15 or whatever I mean we're looking at a huge amount of time here and the company has told him well we'll compensate your overtime because you will be able to recoup those days and take time off yeah and then most people are like "Ooh, I can do that or, or what and they're like, cool, then I'll work over for four months because then I can take a really long summer vacation. But I've, I actually told him, I counted out for him how many hours he's burning a week. If I count up all the hours that he's burning an average a week until E3, then he would be entitled to like one and a half months of extra vacation on top of his normal one and a half months or whatever. I mean, the company is never going to give him one and a half months of vacation, especially not because they're alpha or whatever. It's just a couple of months after E3. They're not just going to give him those months. So he's going to invest all his time into this. And I told him so, but he's never going to get his time back. And it's not going to get time money either. Well, maybe he could get a payment for that, but still. I mean, this, this is the kind of tricks. You tell the employees, well, you get compensated for it. But then after that, you say, oh, well, sorry, but we can't really give you two months of vacation, but we'll give you two weeks. And then the guy says, oh, I get two weeks free vacation. But you were actually entitled to one and a half months, you know, so. Um, so yeah, but in any case, I mean, with overtime in general, lots of people, they work over until they're almost dead. They work over for months, 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 months long. The game goes on sale. It ends up selling like shit and the company is bankrupt a week later. And that's why <laughs> what you invested your time in. So usually overtime is also an uh, um, indication of a problem in general. I mean, if you have to work over for months, months, months long, there is a problem somewhere probably. Otherwise you wouldn't have to do that. Uh, so someone mismanaged, someone thought they could get away with less money for the game. I mean, a smaller devel development budget, fewer people, not enough people, not enough time, something. They, someone thought they could get away with it, someone made a mistake, someone designed the game in the wrong way that, would take, that it takes much more time than anticipated. So I don't have to pay the price for that. And it's also, I mean, for example, it happened at Starbreeze. I mean, it's not, it's not a pro it wasn't a problem yet, but I saw the problem coming. That's also one of, one of the reasons but I didn't, uh, why I quit somewhat. Because um, we were in pre-production. And in pre-production, we're supposed to reach production at date X. And I already passed date X. And so we were supposed to have X months pre-production. And in the pre-production, the designers would come up with the design of the game, you know, pre-production, fi figure out the game. And then when the production starts, everyone would start working on the levels and would be full speed ahead because we have a release date set on X. Problem is, um, the designers couldn't really figure out what to do. So we hit the production deadline, but we were still, they were still discussing what to do. So production was moved. So we went into longer pre-production, but the real deadline wasn't moved. So now we got longer pre-production, but we got shorter real production because the real deadline is set. And this is a real big problem because the people who are designing game in pre-production, the people who are working on the game most, the first few months or year or whatever, are of people like writers and uh, game designers and things like that. And then once they're done with their thing, the work is going to move over to the, uh, the scripters, the level designers, modelers, programmers, all those. The real developers really make the game. Problem is, the writers and whatever, they can take as long as they want to. Because they're not going to have a lot of work at the end of the game. They're not going to have to do a lot of QA and all that on their game. So they can take their time, but in the meantime, the real developers they get a lot of stress. Because their entire thing is compressed, you know. That's the major issue. So the, the, the writer shifts the problem to the, to the normal developer. Because if the writer needs six months instead of four months, then the developers suddenly have two months less time. So the, the, the writers are taking their time and the designers, and in the end of the, the, the development, it are the real, well, real developers who are having to do massive overtime to compensate of the problem that the writers caused in the beginning. And they're not doing overtime because they're done with their part. And that's so fucked up when it happens. So. But for all those reasons, I really don't like to do overtime at all. But it's hard to avoid, I guess, if you're a beginner. I mean, it's different too. I have my own game now. I work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I do overtime. I don't really care. Because I know if I do my game well, and if it sells well, I'm going to get this much cash. And that's cool. But if I work for a company, and I work 60 hours a week, I know, well, either I lose my job within a month, or I'm going to get a week vacation, or I'm going to get a bonus of 20,000 kroner. That's it. I mean, that's not very motivating. So, 
Um, yeah. I don't know about the difference between programmer and, and artist. Why? Could be because maybe there are more artists, perhaps, in a way. So if you have a, a larger amount of people who want to do it, you could uh, get away with offering less money. Something like that. Um, but in any case, living in the United States is more expensive too, in a way. Then again, yeah, kind of balance maybe. I mean, you have less taxes in, in, in the United States, more in Europe, and everything is more expensive in America. So you do have less, more money after taxes, but you do have to spend more money too. So kind of balance it out. Um, but I don't know what is the specific difference between program and artists in America. No, I don't know. Probably because there are more artists, I would ca guess. So yeah. Apart from Sweden, uh, which countries are uh, a good place to uh, to uh, that's where a job is uh, as a game designer? Um. Well, the United Kingdom has by far the most companies in Europe, I guess. Canada is, of course, really good too. I mean, Canada is probably the best choice, I guess. They really promote games industry, and they have a lot and a lot of companies by now, and it's a nice place to live, and it's reasonably easy to get a, a visa for that. So Canada, I guess, United Kingdom. Problem in the United Kingdom is that it's a bit of its own culture, and I think in the United Kingdom, you have a lot of crappy companies, really small companies too. A lot of companies are not really going well or doing smaller games. I mean, if you're happy doing a smaller game, of course, it's fine, but still. And other than that, there's not that much, actually. Uh, Germany has its kind of its own type of game, strategy games thingy, that kind of thing, or garbage truck simulator, I found, German game. It's very nice. So they have those kind of games. They have their own market a bit. But it would probably be reasonably easy to get into Germany. France is horrible, because only speak French. I have no clue about English, and uh, their their industry is reasonably big, somewhat. Well, reasonably, and I mean Holland, they 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 went up quite okay, same like Sweden. But then this year, whatever, they also kind of like a bump down. They lost companies like Streamline Studios, like Coded Illusion, I think, a couple of other ones. So Holland's not perfect either. I mean, it's quite hard really to find a job and a good place. So, and the south of Europe is completely dead anyway. You can't find work in the south of Europe. So, hmm. anything else? What about uh, Asia? Yeah, I don't know that much about Asia. I mean, of course, South Korea and Japan, the biggest ones. But I don't know specifically that much. I do know that if you're if you're white and you go to there, you get paid five times what the Asians get if you're lucky. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, they have a different culture as well. It's it's more hierarchic, you know. More I'm the boss and you do what I tell you to do. More of that kind of thing, which is nice, of course, if you're white and you're the boss. But other than that, um, it's a different culture. You have to be able to cope with that. So. But I don't know that much about it. I know one, a couple of guys that did it, yeah. They have lived there for a couple of years. So but I never really asked them how they experienced doing that. In any case, if you do move to a far away region, there are other things you have to keep in mind. I mean, you're far away from everyone you know, and from your family and whatever, and you probably have to fly back once a year at least. It's a lot of extra money. I mean, that's going to cost you money to do that. Uh, if you would go to Australia, for example, at one point, I almost moved to Australia, but I didn't really trust the company. Um, so they just sent me a contract to sign while I haven't even been there. That's a bad thing. I mean, it shouldn't be too easy. If it's too easy, something is wrong. You know, you can't just send me a contract, sign it, and I will work for you. I will have to go there. If you just try to hire me without inviting me over, something is wrong. Especially if it's all the way on the other side of, of the world. So I didn't do that. But if you go to Australia, you're looking for 20 hours or whatever plane. You're going to be sit stuck in a plane for 20 hours. What does it cost? 20,000 kron or whatever to fly there? I mean, that's a lot of money to waste every year on that. And it's a very tiring experience. So if you move far away, you're far away from everyone you know, it's going to cost you money to fly back every time you want to do something. Uh, it's going to cost you money to move, of course. I mean, if you want to move from there, you have to buy a container. 
and then put uh, the, the container on a ship and three weeks later it's delivered in a harbor near you. I mean, it's madness. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you have that problem. And of course, if you go to Asia, it's a different culture and things. What if you get sick or what if something goes wrong? You're completely stuck there. You might not understand them. It's a, a different language. You have a language problem as well anyway. So, yeah, you have to be able to cope with all that. Hmm, yeah. What's your experience with outsourcing, like uh, buying freedom models from Asia? I never did it. Well, the, the Guerrilla Games, where I worked for, they did it with their first game, which was about Vietnam, and they hired a company s um, somewhere around there, funny enough, but uh, I never, I didn't have anything to do with that. My lead, my lead just bought them. And, but I know that a lot of people don't actually like the results they're getting or whatever. Maybe it's somewhat cheaper, but then you have to spend half the day fixing what they've done. And if you count up all those hours together, it's still only somewhat cheaper than if you just just have done it yourself. So I'm not sure about that. But maybe then again, maybe there are some good companies. I mean, it probably just depends who you hire, I guess. But still, I prefer to do everything in house if I would have the choice, I guess, or a company near you so you can actually go there and talk to the people rather than some Asians on the other side of the planet, I guess. Hmm. Anything else? Nope. Complete silence. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.